Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Carlos Ortiz. I am proud to be a white collar and tax partner here at Baker Hostetler. And I want to thank you for joining me and some of my colleagues and friends uh, from my firm as we spend some time um, chatting with you about FIPA. Um, so what is FIPA? FIPA is DOJ's new tool uh, that they received in December to prosecute uh, global um, corruption. And so we want to spend some time now uh, with you just um, telling you what we really think you need to know about FIPA. Um, and importantly, also what we think you need to be doing right now as uh, FIPA takes effect. So again, what is FIPA? So in FIPA, uh, FIPA generally is aimed directly at foreign officials um, and making it actually a US federal crime uh, for them to receive or solicit benefits, um, bribe payments, similar to what is covered under the, um, the FCPA, which has been around since 1977 and really started to get prosecuted in the mid 2000s. Um, FIPA specifically expands the scope of the FCPA because FIPA says that anything that is already covered by the FCPA cannot be used. FIPA can't be used to prosecute that. So by its actual language, it expands the scope of the statute. Um, we think obviously FIPA is going to be used, uh, it could be used to prosecute foreign officials um, and it's aimed directly at them. But also FIPA, we believe, will be used to, um, to fill maybe gaps in the FCPA to prosecute foreign officials and foreign entities. Because FIPA ex expressly can't be used to cover language um, used under the FCPA that's covered by the FCPA, there's, uh, we believe, a good chance FIPA will not or can't be used to cover foreign bribery by U.S. individuals or U.S. companies. So that being said, if you're a U.S. individual or U.S. company, why do you care about FIPA? And here's why. Because FIPA, we think, will significantly increase the volume of foreign prosecutions uh, and global corruptions, excuse me, and global prosecutions. And once that happens, we think it will lead to more FCPA prosecutions. And why is that so? If the U.S., if DOJ prosecutes foreign officials, foreign officials uh, to prevent themselves from either maybe coming to the U.S. to face prosecution and maybe dealing with being prosecuted in their home country, will name folks that they are paying or receiving bribes or benefits from in their home countries, which will for sure include U.S. companies and U.S. individuals. Um, and also, if FIPA is used by extension with um, 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 conspiracy under 371 or aiding and abetting, um, which prosecutors are clearly familiar with doing, foreign companies will for sure probably name um, U.S. companies that are similarly engaged in industry probes and other bribes as well. So when that starts to happen, we think that FIPA is going to lead to a lot more prosecutions. And FIPA also has, which is, I think, sort of unusual, and I've been doing this for a long, long time, um, a reporting requirement that requires DOJ prosecutors to say how they've been using this and reporting that to Congress and on a public website, and also how this is being used by foreign um, officials to protect um, U.S. companies and stamp out uh, foreign bribery. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce um, my fellow panelists in a minute, but before a couple of words from our sponsors. Um, those of you who uh, participate in this will receive CLE credit, very important for all of us to maintain our law licenses. Um, the information is going to appear in a chat link, uh, and you'll see that. Two thirds through this presentation, a magic word is going to appear that you can put in, that you can get for that. And for those of you who missed that for any reason, um, our good friend Baruch, who has been instrumental in helping us put this thing together, um, is going to email it to you as well. So there'll be opportunities to make sure you get those valuable, uh, those valuable credits. So let me introduce the, uh, the speakers here, starting out with, the, uh, with Pat Campbell. Uh, Pat Campbell is a partner in our New York White Collar Group. 
Um, he's a member, along with the other New Yorkers here, of our um, Chambers ranked New York practice. Uh, John Barr, not there, but he's perennially ranked in Chambers in DC all by himself. Um, uh, Pat, in addition to being a star white collar lawyer and litigator, was up until recently the chair of the New York State Bar Compliance Committee. So Pat is a true guru in the compliance world, in addition to all the other amazing things he does. Uh, the handsome fellow next to him is John New. Um, John, in addition to being, John was in the Southern District of New York, where he was one of their top prosecutors, is a star here at the firm dealing with complex issues and representing companies and individuals. Um, if you look closely over John's left, uh, over his head, you'll see that he received some kind of a bizarre Oscar from federal uh, agents, uh, which he told us about before. So if you get to work with John, maybe you get to see that in person at some point. Um, and then, of course, our D.C. Um, star, who was in the SEC Enforcement Unit and the Fraud Section, and has done uh, more FCPA work than, than, uh, than most of us um, here in the firm, John Barr. Um, and John, um, um, like, is, again, is, um, is, is a tremendous lawyer um, who was well recognized uh, in, this expert, in this field. And our star, rock star associate, Kaylee B. Sullivan, over here as well, who's joining us to keep us, uh, to keep us honest and level here um, on the right. Um, in addition to being a star associate um, and writing and participating and also representing clients in FCPA matters in India and Mexico, um, Kaylee also uh, assisted uh, me in, keep, in trying the FIFA, the FIFA case recently and wrote uh, the first version and was instrumental in writing the Rule 29 motion, which uh, Judge Chen granted in reversing the verdict. Um, and to the far left, that's me doing my best Yoda impersonation. Uh, I'm a former act, Army Jack lawyer with an LLM in tax, tax division for five years, U.S. Attorney's Office in New Jersey for 10 years. When I left, I was the Deputy Acting Chief of the Criminal Division. And I've been in private practice now for 19 years, uh, doing primarily criminal tax and a significant volume of FCPA work. Um, so with that, let's go right into it. The statute itself. So DOJ, um, excuse me, the Congress passed this statute, FIFA, in December. Um, and of course, when a new statute comes out, especially in December, we turn to our best and brightest, like Kelly Sullivan, and say, Kelly, tell us what's in this thing. You know, what? What, uh, what's in the statute and um, give us a clue of, of what, what's here and read the statute and please tell us uh, what are we looking at. So, Kelly, please take it away and, and let, let us know what's going on here, please. Sure. Um, so just a brief uh, overview of the statute here. Um, it's notable that it wasn't implemented as an amendment to the FCPA um, under Title IX, but instead was implemented as an amendment to the domestic bribery statute under Title 18. And it could be that Title 18 is simpler, and so prosecutors may feel more comfortable bringing charges under it. Um, it also doesn't have a lot of the same exceptions that the FCPA has, such as a facilitating payment exception, reasonable marketing expenses, and conduct that would be lawful under local law. But practically, it may not make so much of a difference because FIFA requires that the act be done with corrupt intent. Uh, and the statute, like the FCPA, includes a list of international organizations where individuals would be considered foreign officials. Um, so it expands the definition beyond what you might think of as just somebody in the government. So let me ask you, you mentioned that it has no facilitating payments or what have been called grease payments. And, and I'm a Jersey guy, which is you know how we function out here in New Jersey with grease payments. Um, so let me just throw this out to the group. Uh, John Barr, do you think that's... Uh, a big deal that this is no longer uh, also john this this doesn't apply to the sec your old colleagues kind of a kind of a little disrespectful there what do you what do you think well i think on the facilitating payments um issue and also the two affirmative defenses that are not referenced um i think those um those exceptions are so well established and deeply embedded in anti-corruption law that but at this point, you know, you know, we've been operating for, gosh, more than 30, 30, 40 years with um, with these exceptions built into the FCPA that I think there'll be a strong argument that 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 activity that is permitted under the FCPA, um, it doesn't constitute corrupt, um, you know, corrupt conduct under the new FIPA statute. Now, 
I will not put it past my former colleagues at the DOJ fraud section to argue that, hey, look, Congress knows how to uh, create um, affirmative defenses and they know how to lay out exceptions um, for certain conduct and they chose not to in FIPA. So um, I think we'll have some strong arguments on the defense side and I think most compliance folks will probably believe those those areas of conduct are still are still not corrupt. But it'll be interesting to see whether DOJ tries to push the envelope. And it's interesting too, right? Because there's a lot of the like the UK Bribery Act don't do not include facilitating payments. So maybe this is a move towards that. Um, John knew Pat Campbell and even Kelly. So you advise clients to now take facilitating payments out of those compliance programs and maybe just now go with the flow or you know, so what, what are you guys thinking with that? You know, in my experience, that's been the trend anyway. And you you mentioned the UK Bribery Act, and you know, doesn't have an exception facilitating payments. And, you know, most of the anti-corruption policies I work on now, uh, you know, don't have that exception, you know, in place or you know, in connection with sort of you know developing the process with you know with the clients. You know, we we just we leave that out. No bribery, no corruption at any time, no matter what, uh, is is usually the trend that these uh, policies are going on. So, you know, I, I don't know, you know, how, how much of a difference that's going to make. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Kelly, you mentioned here too, the rule of construction in FIPA. Tell us uh, what, what can you tell us about that. That's kind of interesting. Sure. So there's a provision uh, in the statute that says that it's not to be construed to cover anything already covered by the FCPA. And that includes uh, both direct and indirect violations of the FCPA. So, for example, a conspiracy charge, um, basically, if that could be brought under the FCPA, prosecutors shouldn't then bring it under FIPA. Yeah, interesting. And then there's also these reporting requirements, right? So that, that's kind of interesting, right, Kelly? You see that in there? Yeah. So um, the uh, U.S. Attorney General has to report, among other things, um, instances of uh, requests for bribes globally, uh, how other countries are doing prosecuting those requests for bribes, uh, U.S. diplomatic efforts uh, combating corruption, and how the DOJ is doing in bringing these cases. And all of that's also going to be publicly available. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, please, Baruch. Um, and here's, uh, so who's actually covered by the statute? So, John, um, so uh, actually Title 201 of Title 18 is the statute that's used to um, re for bribes received or solicited by U.S. officials. And this just now adds to that list on the bottom there, as Kaylee mentioned. Um, so tell us, you know, what who's covered under foreign official? It doesn't seem as simple as it as it looks right there. But why don't you give us uh, your insights? Sure. Um, you know, in terms of who uh, is considered a foreign official that is prohibited from accepting anything of value, you know, in exchange for essentially, essentially a bribe. Um, a lot of the definitions of foreign official and FIPA track the same definitions in the FCPA. Um, so, for example, you know, any official or employee of a foreign government or any department agency or instrumentality of a foreign government um, is covered under both. Same thing for anyone acting in official capacity on behalf of a foreign government or any official or employee of a public international organization. And, you know, it, it, we'll see what actually happens, but I would assume that, you know, because the language is the same or similar, um, they're going to be interpreted the same way. Uh, but what's interesting and what's notable is there are a few differences between who's covered under FIPA and who's covered under the FCPA. Um, the first uh, being that uh, in addition to covering a person acting in an official capacity on behalf of a government or entity, um, it also covers a person acting in an unofficial capacity. Um, now, what exactly is an unofficial capacity is not defined anywhere in FIPA or in any current regulations. Um, and I think, you know, when we get into a little more of the, you know, where we think this is headed later on, I think there. You know, there's there's a lot of ambiguity there in terms of what DOJ is going to consider someone acting in unofficial capacity. And as John mentioned, I think before, you know, we can anticipate DOJ is going to be very aggressive uh, in their definitions. Um, the second sort of notable difference is that 
Um, the FCPA contains uh, a, a prohibition on uh, bribing a candidate for a foreign political office. Um, and that particular phrase, candidate, is not anywhere in FIPA. Instead, FIPA refers to senior political figures. Uh, and that's that's a new term in, in this area. Uh, in terms of the definition of it, actually, the statute refers to a treasury regulation um, that, that lays out what a, what a senior figure is. Um, and, you know, if you, if you take a look at that, you'll see it's in some ways broader than the FCPA, in some ways narrower. For example, it applies to not only current officials, but former officials. Um, but, um, you know, the question I think going forward would also be, you know, does that, is that broad enough to encompass a candidate? Uh, because as I mentioned before, candidates aren't expressly included in the FIPA definition of foreign official. Uh, so we'll have to see how that plays out. Uh, I'm sure DOJ is going to be aggressive, and I'm sure the defense bar is going to be equally aggressive in trying to cabin the uh, definitions to the smallest possible use. And when you're looking at on that, you can count on that, John. We're going to be very aggressive in uh, defending our clients for sure. Yeah. And, and I guess, too, when you're looking at, you know, unofficial capacity, right? I guess so you're you're looking at this and you're saying, you know, how do you how do you how do you bake into a compliance program? somebody acting in an unofficial capacity, right? I mean, is that like some guy who's in a, in, in a back alley and, it was, you know, you, you make sure that you were not dealing with people acting in official or unofficial capacity, right? That, that's a new term that, um, you know, in, 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 and as you deal with unofficial capacities in a global environment, right? I mean, that's going to be, that's going to be challenging and you're going to have to really think through and talk to your country markets and your country reps about what that could possibly mean, right? And it's it's a brand new term, um, it's a brand new statute, and it's going to be that, that's going to be a challenge, I think, for compliance people. And you're going to have to really talk to your local market folks to find out what what can poss what can this possibly be because it could be expanded out. So we'll see where this yeah, goes. I think, uh, I think that's a that's a really good question. Like, what would be someone working in an unofficial capacity for on behalf of uh, you know, the government or instrumentality. Um, I, you know, in my thinking about it, I thought, well, maybe it could be, you know, I mean, oftentimes state state owned oil companies will hire like an EPC or someone like that. And sometimes the EPC hires someone, uh, you know, someone independent, someone independent or some other party to assist. Maybe it's designed to reach something like that. But um it doesn't. It doesn't immediately occur top of mind of what exactly you know who that person would be that would be acting in an unofficial capacity for on behalf. You know what comes to mind, John? Too right for those of us again, a lot of us do. And, and John, you know, we we've done a lot of FCPA work over the years. A lot of the prosecutions under the FCPA involve distributors or the the quote unquote agent, um, and that's where these cases come from. And a lot of times there's not going to be a contract, right? There's not going to be somebody who's officially acting with something to say, hey, I've been hired to solicit a bribe or something for this company or for this person or to pay bribes. So now this unofficial capacity may not be covered by the FCPA because there may not be that formal distributor relationship. So the unofficial capacity may fill that hole for the FCPA, it may be now an issue for the U.S. company to worry about if you've got these unofficial people acting on behalf of your company that your sales folks are using, this could fill that gap on an aiding and abetting or conspiracy. Again, this is, again, at some point we'll talk about it, but DOJ is usually not reticent to employ these tools. So this may be a gap filler for them where those contracts don't exist and people are acting in that unofficial capacity. But time will tell, right? Um, yeah. And in the past, as we all knew, these foreign officials really were cleanly, were not cleanly prosecuted. You needed money laundering or something else to get them. Now, DOJ's got a specific statute they can use. So we'll see. But moving along to the next slide, please. Um, who is covered? Uh, so, um, Pat, why don't you tell us about, obviously, there's approved international organizations and there's a lot of these, you know, goodness. I mean, there's, I think, over 300 of them that fall into this uh, situation. Um, I know we're, we're, we're using a lot of time here. Pat, why don't you tell us um, 
a little yeah. bit about these and these were covered by the FCPA, but how do you advise clients, my man, to, to, yeah. you know, to make sure you're aware of these, you know, what do you, what right. do you do? there's a ton of them and it's, and you know, it's, it's a good refresher because, you know, this is part of the FCPA, so this is not new. Um, but, you know, again, you know, it just shows the scope of foreign official, how broad it is. And sometimes it's not so obvious, right. Which makes it harder to identify, uh, you know, so what is a public international organization? Basically, with you know, the president by executive order says it is. Um, you know, as FIFA defines it, it's uh, organizations designated as such by president per executive order, pursuant to the International Organizations Immunities Act, for the purposes of FIFA. So, you know, what we put on this slide is a cut and paste from the State Department website where you could find the current list. And uh, if you go to the next slide, we provided you know some examples. So. You know, a lot, a lot of the public international organizations um, are intergovernmental organizations like the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, but the list also includes some independent not-for-profit organizations like the International Fertilizer Development Center. So, you know, sometimes it doesn't meet the eye test. You might not be able to identify what a public international organization is just by looking at the name, um, you know, which, which just makes it more, more complicated to identify them. In terms of the compliance, you know, it's all about, you know, staying staying on top of on, you know, on the developments, right? You know, there is a website that you go to that has a list. Uh, it's updated. And, you know, just having those checks and balances in place and good due diligence, you know, third party due diligence procedures uh, that, you know, have gateways such, you know, that, you know, when you're vetting a third party, you know, here's here's part of that vetting process. Um, you know, and incorporating this, you know, into that vetting process, you know, is probably a good idea. And I think you're right. I think, you, I think you, go ahead, John. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, if you're, if you're in the business of selling coffee, you want to make sure that you understand that the International Coffee Organization is on that yeah. list. And uh, I, I mean, you know, be and careful I think, about your interactions. I think you're right, John. I think the lesson is whatever organism, whatever industry you're in, you may want to just double check to see that, if there's an organization that's involved um, in that in that industry, um, you know, you really need to go back because, I mean, you know, who would have thought that, you know, the, the wild fauna and flora organization is involved and, you know, you never know, you know, what what amount, what benefit that you provide is going to tip the scale towards prosecution. You know, the Bureau of Weights and Measures, so a bad joke on my part, so play your five nights a week, couldn't resist. Um, so um, anyway. Um, but we'll move along. So, but some of them again, you know, the World Health Organization. So clearly, Red Cross. If you're in the pharmaceutical healthcare, you know, you some of those, you know, you may know. But Red Cross, World Health Organization, just got to be, you know, they're, they're there. And you know, UNICEF for children. Um, so let's go to the um, next one. What is covered, um, John? I mean, obviously, you have significant experience in the FCPA, and you know that, as you say. The DOJ is, you know, it's, I think this is limited by what's in a prosecutor's imagination from Polish charities to uh, flights to Disney World trips. Um, um, and, you know, um, what are your thoughts then on how you think FIFA, what type of conduct is going to fall in to what might be covered by FIFA versus the FCPA and, and your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so what I, you know, I'm not going to read the, I'm not going to read the slide, but you, you can obviously see that this applies to foreign officials or somebody selected by a foreign official to correctly demand, seek, receive, accept, or agree to receive or accept, you know, anything of value, a bribe. And, um, you know, I think it's interesting that, that because oftentimes the way bribes work in the, in, in foreign corruption is, you know, the foreign official tries to isolate himself a little bit from asking for or demanding the bribe. So it's interesting that they have, you know, put in here that um, this also pre, pre it applies and prohibits a person selected by a foreign official um, to corruptly demand or seek a bribe. I think, um, obviously, you know, some of the elements here are very similar to what's in the FCPA. I, the corruptly element is a, is a key element for those of us that practice in both the defense space and the compliance space. So corruptly is 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 very important. It has to be corrupt. Have, have, there has to be a quid pro quo. Um, the other thing I think that's that's interesting here is um, it's uh, it's something anything of value 
either personally for the foreign official or any other person or non-governmental entity. Um, and so that I think also recognizes that oftentimes foreign officials demand that the payment be made to a relative or a friend or another person or another entity to try to obscure the fact that the foreign official is benefiting. So um, I think that's a, an, another interesting thing of the, uh, about the statute. A lot of the other language, um, it, you know, the, the language that follows in return for, a, lo a lot of that is very similar to what's in um, the FCPA. And so I think those in our audience will be very familiar with, with what that means. I, I do think that in the 18 USC uh, 201 context, official act has, there's a lot of, there's a lot of precedent in 18 USC 201 as to exactly what official act is and what it isn't. And, you know, I think that perhaps maybe in the FCPA space, there hasn't been so much concentration on, on that. But when you look at that third bullet where it says conferring any improper advantage, that really kind of wraps everything up in terms of what, what's prohibited uh, by the FCPA and bringing it right into um, right into into FIPA. And John, I think it also bears mentioning too, right, that so let's say you want to make a donation, a charitable donation to a hospital. You want to donate a computer system to the actual hospital itself, as opposed to the official, you know, to the, you know, to the person, uh, you know, that typically is conduct and that's typically something you can do. Right. And, and obviously you have to put in place the appropriate compliance and monitoring to make sure that computers aren't going out the door every five minutes and you're not replacing them. And all of a sudden, you know, different healthcare providers are, are getting new computers. But if, but if you see the hot, you know, the, the hot, the computers are staying in the hospital and they're benefiting Maybe it has, like to, be, it has to be something. It has to be something of value that benefits the the foreign official or you know some other non governmental entity or person. Um, right. You know, you could you could. I, I suppose there could be a push the envelope argument that if if you did something that increased the stature of the foreign official in some way, there might be an argument. But in the criminal context, I would say that's probably pretty weak. <laughs> Right. But but you could donate something again to to an ent to the actual entity, to the hospital, to something. It, this, this this applies to the person. And, and again, coming back to the core, it's to increase something of benefit for yourself to an individual making a bad, you know. A, a, yeah, there's a no person. you can you know, you can you can provide a benefit to the government itself. And there's right. there, there's been opinion procedure releases where that's been addressed. Right. Exactly. So that's interesting, too. I guess one thing we didn't see in here, too, would be the um, um, the 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 opinion that you see in the FCPA uh, language, I guess. Not that I don't know how frequently those are used. Yeah, we don't, just... it, I mean, there's been quite a few, but, you know, you don't see that. There's no reference yeah. to an opinion procedure under 201, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. OK, so let's go to uh, where does this apply? And John, let's 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 stay with you on this. Um, obviously, the, the title of the, the statute has foreign, so it's going to apply overseas. It's extraterritorial federal jurisdiction. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a new tool. It's something for DOJ to, as they say, um, expand the use of the FCPA. Uh, but obviously, you know, as, as, as you know, a phrase I use, because it's without the use of a time machine, we don't know how they're really going to use it. And if you used the time machine, John, to just go and look at how this was used, I'd be disappointed in you as a friend instead of using it for something more interesting. Uh, but um, but what do you, any any thoughts on you know how the um, the jurisdiction? Um, I know there's you know we talked about Hoskins and you and I have talked about this, but your thoughts on how this might be applied and where? Yeah, it might I think apply? it's I, I think it's pretty significant that in this statute, it specifically the express language says an offense shall be subject to extraterritorial federal jurisdiction. Um, I think that's a big deal, you know, under uh, Morrison and, um, you know, where statute is silent on extraterritorial jurisdiction, um, jurisdiction is presumed to be territorial unless there's a clear indication of, of a broader intent um, to make it extraterritorial. And, you know, the FCPA has been interpreted interpreted as having limited extraterritoriality in certain instances. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in the U.S. v. Hoskins case, that was one of the factors considered, the fact that it was not expressly um, 
uh, stated in the statute to be extraterritorial federal jurisdiction. That was considered in the court's decision um, where the court, you know, Hoskins kind of involved a, a UK national employee of a UK subsidiary of a French company. How much more complicated can it get than that? Um, and Hoskins, Lawrence Hoskins never visited the U.S. Um, he didn't take actions in the U.S., but DOJ prosecuted him for conspiracy to violate the FCPA. The Second Circuit held that um, DOJ could not um, prosecute him under the FCPA for conspiracy or accomplice liability um, because he was not included in the specific categories of defendants enumerated in the FCPA who could be prosecuted. Um, he wasn't an issuer, he wasn't a domestic concern, he wasn't an officer, director, or employee. The Second Circuit did allow DOJ to proceed against him under an agency theory because agents are one of the enumerated categories of defendants that can be prosecuted. And eventually, uh, DOJ lost that case on appeal uh, at the district court level and on appeal in terms of the agency theory prosecution. So I think one thing we all, I think, we probably all on this panel think is that FIPA um, may, you know, FIPA doesn't have the same enumerated categories of defendants built into its um, statutory language. It has this extra terror express extraterritorial federal jurisdiction language. You know, there's a, I, I, I would not be surprised if DOJ argued that, that FIPA is designed to allow them to pursue um, foreign uh, individuals and foreign companies who uh, don't take any actions in the United States and aren't in the United States, um, uh, but who are engaged in um, in conduct that uh, you know relates uh, conspires or being accomplice to a federal to a foreign official um, seeking a bribe or demanding a bribe. And you, and you and you obviously never want to be on the other side of that phone call, right? Trying to explain why you don't have, why you, there's no touch points or anything. So once you get to that point, and again, it seems like this is FIFA was meant for maybe to fix, you know, certain holes in in the FCPA, right? To give DOJ maybe more of that expansion. Yeah, you know, and with times. Hoskins, and with Hoskins, you know, DOJ kind of demonstrated they yeah. they they believe mm -hmm. want to be able to go after foreigners that have no touch point in the U.S. Right. <laughs> for conspiracy or accomplice liability. And, you know, even after the Second Circuit came down with that opinion in their FCPA guidance, DOJ said, yeah, well, that applies to the Second Circuit and, you know, not anywhere else. So I would not be surprised if FIPA is used to go after the, Hos the Lawrence Hoskins type of, of defendant that's out there. Again, increasing the, the, the broad scope of for sure prosecuting or going after foreign officials, you holding a hammer over their head and foreign companies, which increase foreign um, corruption prosecutions, which spill over everywhere and increase, I think, FCPA prosecutions. Um, uh, John New, before we move on, your thoughts on the on the Gen 2 penguins? You think that they might elect a leader and be subject to this because of the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living per uh, resources. I, I guess, you know, look, if the penguins are unofficial, uh, you know, acting in unofficial capacity on behalf of some Antarctic government, maybe. Uh, but uh, I, I doubt DOJ is looking to uh, go after penguins. I think they have other uh, fish to fry to mix, mix metaphors. They don't want to push the envelope that far. Yeah. <laughs> well said, John. This is this is why John gets an Oscar, of course. You know, John is always <laughs> John is a, uh, so, John, so assuming they go after the uh, the penguins, uh, let's go to the next slide. What, what, what can happen to the, to the to the spiritual leader of the Gen 2 penguins? So maybe not maybe not the Gen 2 penguin guy, but somebody else who violates this on a more serious level. Not yeah. that the Gen 2 penguins are not serious and that Antarctic provision is not serious, but something yeah. else. Just, just to bring us back down to solid ground, um, you know, penalties... Uh, under FIPA are, I, I guess the best word is they're different than under the FCPA. Um, you know, as you can see on the slide here, it's a very straightforward penalty provision, criminal penalties only, um, which is that, you know, any person, and that person can be an individual or a corporation or entity, uh, can be fined up to $250,000 or three times the monetary equivalent. 
uh, and imprisoned for not more than 15 years. Now, um, in comparison, you know, the FCPA, um, you know, has a couple of different provisions. Corporations are distinguished from individuals under the FCPA. The fines are much higher, um, you know, up to $2, $2 million per violation for a company. Um, and <clears throat> there the alternative fine provision applies, which is two times the monetary equivalent of value. So which one's bigger? A little hard to say. Um, but I don't think that that in any event, DOJ is going to be trimming its sails on the types of sanctions it's seeking to negotiate uh, when it gets to settlements. Fair enough. Um, and again, this is not, you know, with the FCPA, you have the SEC, um, the SEC involved. This is this is pure criminal, right? So this this is going to be criminal statutes to get a complete disrespect yeah. to John's former colleagues in the SEC. That's right. Yeah, and, it's, and, interesting. You know, it's interesting. The SEC. Well, it's not that surprising because the SEC, you know, generally is. Um, the issuer, the, the issuer portion of the FCPA is what drives their jurisdiction. Mm. But yeah, uh, exactly. Hey, right, Carlos, so let's move. Two, Sorry, Carlos, two other quick points. No, go ahead, John. Please. Uh, yeah, yeah, the first is picking up on where you said you were mentioning about the SEC. You know, there's no accounting or books and records type provisions under FIPA, right? Um, so that's a little bit different. It's only the substantive offense, and it's the accounting and books and record provisions where the penalties can get really high. Um, the second is there's no explicit prohibition on companies indemnifying any officers or directors who are penalized. Um, in practice, I think that's going to be the case anyway. The DOJ wouldn't be too happy about that, but it's not expressly in the statute. Yeah. Um, you know, guys, so let's let's stop because we, we 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 do have a question here that <clears throat> I think is probably worth addressing at this point. I'm just going to throw this out to the panel. Uh, for a company that has a robust anti-corruption compliance program, what is the new concern with FIPA? It seems that the risk is for entities or persons outside of the U.S. seeking bribes, demand side, but does not really change the risk profile or necessary compliance steps for U.S. companies operating overseas. Are we missing something? Um, yeah, I, I would just say the the one the one little aspect we might be missing there is just in the difference in the definition of uh, a foreign official. And so you would want to, if you have a robust compliance program, you're going to want to adjust that definition so that there's not some conduct that wouldn't be an FCPA violation that could be a violation of FIPA if you were charged under conspiracy or accomplice liability. So. Um, you know, the look, having a robust uh, compliance program certainly provides incredible protection. And I would just make it a little more robust by incorporating some of the definitional differences in your in your policies going forward. I, I think, look, at the end of the day, too, and we'll get to this. I don't want to jump out in front. We'll come back to it in a minute when we talk about some of the other things. And I think why there's an enhanced risk for um, FCPA compliance. Um, you know, for FCPA prosecutions as well as FIPA. And actually, we're going to jump to that in a minute now with the uh, reporting requirements that I think will increase foreign corruption prosecutions. But look, you have to look at your business partners, too. I think when you're doing your due diligence, to the extent you're, you're doing business with foreign, uh, foreign companies that are going to be clearly um, subject, maybe they weren't as clearly under the gun under FCPA, they were probably for sure under your FCPA anti-compliance because they're doing business with you as your agent. Uh, but to the extent now that maybe they were more supply side, it may be an unofficial uh, risk. I, FIPA clearly may now cover them if they were taking bribes or involved in some way providing benefits unofficially uh, as a representative of a foreign official. Now they're hit by FIPA. And if you're doing business with them and they are covered, and they somehow provide some financial risk to you, DOJ may consider that, you know, with their broad approach that you were somehow benefiting. So I think your due diligence may have to increase. Um, in addition to, you know, the unofficial capacity, I think is something that is out there. I um, mean, look, and I think the increased uh, risk of prosecutions is just something in and of itself, because as DOJ DOJ is going to use this, right? I don't think anybody on this panel would disagree that DOJ is going to be given this panel. And actually, let me maybe I could just jump to the next slide because that may answer this. Um, 
part of this, which I think most of us, you know, have been doing this kind of work for goodness, 35 years now, uh, about longer. It's rare to see uh, a federal statute that has reporting requirements. Um, I don't know that I've seen a lot of these, you know, and, and said something baked into Title 18. Um, this literally is going to require the Department of Justice at the end of the year um, and every year going forward in consultation with the Secretary of the State to submit to a committee, um, to the you know, to, to committees of judiciaries of foreign relations in the Senate and the House, and also to put on a public website, you know, what happened as a result of this statute. Um, I mean, they literally have to list, they have to evaluate the effectiveness of the DOJ in enforcing this statute, this section. They have to detail what resources or legislative action DOJ needs to ensure adequate enforcement of this section. I, mean, I don't think I've ever seen that, you know, and I don't know, John, John knew you guys, you know, and Pat, you, know, but the, the, you know, you know, the grayer guys on this panel, I don't know that I've seen that where DOJ actually has, I mean, maybe there's some out there that I'm just not familiar with, but they're going to have to now evaluate this. And if they're not using it, they're going to have to explain why. And so I think they're going to use this. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I'm not going to borrow John's Baker time machine, but, um, but, there, you know, this there's, there's a reporting require, and they're going to have to update this annual. So, you know, they're going to, and when you prosecute, having been involved in FCPA investigations, there's always those emails from competitors uh, that say, well, when you and you're when you're cooperating as part of the principles of uh, prosecution, you have to turn over things to DOJ. And when they see these emails, they want to know about the competitor emails. And if you're listed, if the foreign company gets prosecuted. They're going to process, you know, they're going to turn this over, as will distributors. There was the panel Pena cases in the past, which resulted in other cases. So I think it certainly enhances the risk. And I don't think DOJ is going to report. We got the statute. We made uh, we didn't the effectiveness was not done because we didn't enforce the statute at all. But John, John Pat, every guy said, welcome your views on these reporting requirements and what the results might be as a result of it. Yeah, look, I agree with all that, Carlos. And I think the one thing to focus on maybe is the last bullet here, that they have to actually tell Congress what resources or legislative action they think they need. Yeah. Um, and, you know, DOJ does that regularly, right? But this is particularly focused on this one area of foreign corruption. Um, you know, there were there were prior versions of this statute that specifically boosted resources at DOJ, like in the... Uh, you know, Office of International Affairs to handle more MLATs, right. things like that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if DOJ takes another run at that uh, yeah. and, and beefs up right. those sections to try to increase their enforcement capacity. I mean, you see a lot of this stuff getting reported. I mean, not the effectiveness of FIPA, obviously, but a lot of the major actions and um, their efforts and their the effectiveness of what they're doing is usually in the DOJ fraud section annual report. So, I think a lot, a lot of this will be kind of, it'll be more, more of the same of what DOJ is used to doing. And, and I agree with you, Carlos. They're going to report that they're effectively enforcing the law. <laughs> right, but, but which means they'll have to do something too, right? I mean, they'll have. I mean, back in the day, you know, 15, 20 years ago when I was at DOJ, there was no exchange of information. That's obviously changed, right? Prosecutors now exchange information. You're seeing more sharing. Um, and, you know, and, and they will come back. I think it's, as John, John knew said, so it was a prior version of this that literally wanted more money for, you know, mutual legal assistance, uh, more money for training, um, the, the fines to go right into a special fund that came out, but maybe that's pre, you know, with this detailing what they need. Well, I'll, 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 I'll add to that and just say yeah. that, you know, one of the things that we hear from DOJ pretty re regularly is that data analytics is becoming a um, mm. huge tool that's used by the department and the DOJ fraud section in particular. And if you are prosecuting um, foreign officials and you're prosecute and you're able to more effectively prosecute the third party agents that are paying the bribes, um, as they do those prosecutions, that's going to be a tremendous source of information in terms of who else these officials are accepting mm -hmm. bribes from, who else the third parties are paying bribes to, and all that's going to go into their data analytics tool, and it's going to yeah. 
yeah, exactly. allow them to effectively identify other potential, you know, companies to try to enforce the statute against or to enforce the FCPA against. Yeah, and I think I think it will I, look. I think it will lead to more FCPA cases, which I think is part of it. But also, your business partners and whether due diligence, whether they were whether they were violating FIPA, may come in. So if we go to the next slide, um, you see that you know there's a dagger and shield to this, right? I think DOJ will say it can be used more affirmatively to court um, foreign officials. You know, can face DOJ prosecution. Um, you know, um, failure to you know to act on this. Um, the shield, you know, I think the, these were put in, you know, at least the spirit of this was to protect U.S. companies, what it really does, who knows, you know, level the playing field, which is what a lot of folks are saying, why, you know, the FCPA doesn't work. Well, I think this was now put in to, to address that, right? Um, so, um, but this was their answer to it. So, um, but I think, let, I think if we go to the unknowns, which is the, the next slide, um, I think, you know, this sort of leads right to that is what what may happen. And again, you know, any, I think anybody who says they know for sure what is going to happen, we, we can't. Right? We don't know what's what, what the landscape is going to be in 2025. But, John Dean's going to tell us exactly what's going to happen. Take it away. <laughs> John's got the Oscar. And, and, yeah, yeah. I, I jumped into my Baker time machine there and I can see. There you go. John, John's, John's got the machine. I turned it over to him. I, I, well, John, yeah, well, you know, and a lot of this, you know, we've been doing this for a long time and you can see, you can see the trends, you know, the players, right? Um, so what, what do you, what do you, what do you think, John? Start us off and then, you know, everybody jump in, you know. Um, sure. and yeah, I, mean, look, I think, I think the baseline is what we've been saying over and over again, right? Which is that this is a shiny new toy for DOJ. They're going to try to push the envelope on it. They're going to use it where they, where they can or where they think they can. Um, and so it's going to take a little while for everything to shake out and see how it actually impacts uh, companies, U.S. companies and foreign companies, as well as individuals. Um, you know, one thing I think just to, 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 to step back for a second is, you know, there are, there are significant legal and political barriers to prosecuting foreign officials, right? I mean, right. You know, no matter how good our relations are with a, with a foreign government, um, they generally do not take too kindly to U.S. law enforcement operating on their soil, or um, you know, taking discovery evidence, they, subpoenas, MLAT requests. I mean, it all has to go through the political process in that country. Um, and and certainly, if the DOJ is prosecuting some high-level government official, they're going to run into barriers. So, you know, I think that's going to be a problem for them. Now. What they may do then is, you know, go to the low hanging fruit, go down to the next level, not the government officials themselves. Right. But like people who are adjacent to them and to the extent that they couldn't get them previously under the FCPA. Now they'll try to get them under the under FIPA. Um, I think that's that's one area. Um, you know, the other unknown, as we mentioned, is some of the terms are undefined. You know, what does it mean to be acting in an unofficial capacity? Uh, what does it mean to be a senior political official? Um, all those things uh, need to be worked out. Um, you know, you, we were speculating earlier, maybe not speculating, educated guesses as to what unofficial capacity might mean. Um, you know, the other thing that comes to mind is how DOJ is going to use this statute, not directly in prosecuting FIPA, but in in similar types of prosecutions or or enforcement actions. So. You know, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, this this kleptocracy initiative that DOJ already has, um, where they're they're going after, you know, the the money, the funds, the assets of foreign government officials. Um, it seems like, you know, this is an area, this is a statute that's that's tailor made for them to to bring more of those actions. Uh, maybe go after some of the the assets where it's not clear whether or not there is a, a, a violation of local law. So, I mean, I think that's an area where they might expand. Another area where they might use this is, you know, bringing RICO prosecutions, you know, because FIPA is in section in Title 18, 201, it's now a RICO predicate. Um, so, you know, that's another possible area where they might push the boundaries. Um, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I don't know, Carlos, I'm also, um, you know, interested in knowing about what what really the impact of these reporting requirements are. And I don't know, maybe you or John um, 
can address you know, what some of the unknowns there are. You know, what, one thing I was just saying, we're thinking about this too. I mean, we're obviously, I, I, I would, <clears throat> I don't, you're right, there's a lot of political and legal. To, but look, what DOJ has not been shy about doing and what they may do, I'm not sure that they're going to extradite. But, you know, there's always the someone, you know, someone stops the plane in Canada and DOJ, you know, has a red flag notice and arrests the foreign official in Canada, right? And then extradites from Canada to the U.S. So that may be a way they, <clears throat> excuse me, they, they do this. And now because it's, it's, it's not the FCP, but it's a bribe statute, maybe that is a way they can use, you know, there's a, a principle called comity, which they can use maybe then to to you know to 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 get you know to get the person into the united states and then and then look and then if that person cooperates then that person's going to name all of the companies or because once you're in the united states facing prosecution then you know people will probably cooperate so <clears throat> that again increases fcpa but that may be one way you know the 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 the, the stopover flight right and that may be a way to, and doj is not shy about using that with red flag notices in the uk friendly countries that they they do this with. So, and there's obviously the aiding and abetting and the the other countries that, you know, they can do this. But I, I see where, so there's, and, and, and folks too on, on in the in the audience, so please feel free to reach out to us afterwards because any one of us is happy to discuss this after. Um, we could spend the better part of the day talking about this. And we've had a lot of engaging conversations about how this is going to be used. But I want to, if we go to the next slide, please, let me give everybody the CLE code, which is HA, FIPA. Um, there it is. Uh, that is for, the, for, for the attendees, we will put the link to the CLE survey in the chat right before the end of the program. And you will also receive the link for the CLE form in an email later this afternoon. You'll need the code for that. Okay. Uh, thanks, Baruch. And by the way, I want to give thank you to Baruch. And to uh, one of our associates, Maria Luavano, who did a tremendous job in helping us put this together. Um, she could have just as easily participated on this panel and probably done a better job for sure than, uh, than I don't know, me, maybe John, but Maria Luavano did a great job. I want to give her a shout out as well. Um, so uh, practical questions. Just I want to make sure we get to this because a lot of people are asking, what do we do? What do we do now? So uh, Pat, put on your guru uh, compliance hat and, and help us out. Yeah, we we talked a lot about this already. You know, there's certain you know expansions of the definition of foreign official in FIPA that you can incorporate into your current anti-corruption policy. Um, you know, think about updating your anti-corruption risk assessments, your third-party due diligence procedures, and particularly because of that, you know, um, unofficial capacity part of FIPA, and how can you address that in your uh, in your third-party diligence procedures? You know, your politically exposed persons analysis becomes even more important until we get a little clearer indication of what exactly the DOJ, um, how they're going to interpret that that part of the new definition. But, you know, taking a step back, look, another theme that, that we've been talking about today is, you know, FIPA, you know, the DOJ will use it and it's going to increase enforcement activity. It's going to increase the information that the DOJ has in its hands about companies and their employees um, by virtue of that. So, so, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, in the first instance that you, that you have, you know, robust anti-corruption policy procedures in place. It's a good time to take a step back and, you know, and refresh, right? Like, take a look. I haven't updated my policy in a couple of years. So maybe it's a good time to do it now because there's a new development here that will increase enforcement activity overall. Or what about your, you know, internal investigations procedures, your internal reporting procedures? You know, um, what you want to, you know, try to make sure that, that you're doing now uh, is being in the position of knowing, being the first to know if there's any uh, potential corruption going on in your company uh, before the government comes a, comes a knock in, just that you can position yourself um, in the best possible way to make those self-disclosure and cooperation decisions that could, um, you know, maximize, um, you know, cooperation benefits if you decide to go down that road. You know, so what does that mean? Um, are your methods of internal reporting well communicated and easily available? To employees, do you have an anonymous hotline operated by a third party? Are your, are your employees comfortable using it? Do they fear retaliation? Do they think that their complaints are going to be followed up on and remediated if uh, you know it's substantiated? Um, you know, do you do you have a written plan for internal investigation so that when the report comes in, you're able to triage it, appropriately route it for investigation? 
um, you know, a plan for conducting the investigation and making sure that um, that they're conducted consistently and that you you account for privilege, you know, when you're conducting those internal investigations. It's it's good, you know, to have to be prepared in advance, right? To have a written to have a plan, you know, a decision tree um, for consistency and so that you're not reinventing the wheel each time, you know, an allegation comes in. Now, now of course, uh, everyone has a plan to to they get punched in the mouth, as uh, a famous boxer once said. So internal investigation plans are supposed to be flexible, so you can roll with those punches as they come in, as they come in your way. And finally, John John Barr mentioned this before that the DOJ, you know, is is incre ever increasingly using data analytics um, to investigate and identify, um, you know, investigations and prosecutions to bring. They also expect companies to use data analytics to identify, um, you know, instances of you know, corrupt conduct that's going on, but also to make sure that their internal investigations and their compliance programs are working effectively. So, you know, are you reviewing, you know, your, are, are you, are you maintaining and assessing data um, that, that is from your internal investigations, that's from your, your reporting lines to make sure that your compliance program and your internal investigation protocols and your reporting protocols are working effectively. So, you know, I think that's it really. There are things that you could do to, you know, take FIPA into account specifically, but I just think it's it's a good time to, you know, take a step back and say, okay, you know, maybe it, you know, maybe it's time to take another look and start, you know, um, refreshing, you know, what you have um, in anticipation of just more, you know, anti-corruption investigations overall. What do you, what do you guys right. think about the impact on disclosure, um, guys? I mean, now let's say. You know, assuming you didn't disclose, look, I mean, you know, the philosophy is, you know, I, I think most folks would say don't disclose, it, you know, unless you think you're going to get caught, right? Because disclosure comes with a lot of issues. Um, but do you think if DOJ, you didn't disclose and DOJ comes back later on and says, hey, we have this available, you know, you should have come to DOJ, you should have come to us. And because we would have taken it seriously, we have FIPA now, you know, we could have prosecuted that official. Um, impact on disclosure and DOJ's view on companies who didn't disclose because of the existence of FIPA. I think the DOJ already has a very firm policy that if, <laughs> if you don't disclose, they're going to, they're going to, uh, right. uh, they're going to be some significant negative consequences to that if they find out about it. Because, and I don't, my personal view is I don't think, I don't think FIPA changes that. I think, you know, maybe that'll, give them another reason to be unhappy, but, you know, they've been prosecuting uh, foreign officials using the money laundering statutes already. So I, I think the, the clear message from DOJ is if you don't disclose and we find out about it, you're going to be treated much poorly. Fair point. I think that's probably, I think that's probably true, John. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes left. There's one question that says, will we be handing out the presentation? I think the answer to that is yes, we'll be sending the presentation out. Um, and we had a hypothetical, but I think we've covered most of the issues already, guys. So uh, John New, any final thoughts from you? And then we'll just go through quickly uh, in a few seconds. Yeah, look, I think I think everybody needs to be paying close attention to exactly how DOJ brings this. I think the first time they bring a case under FIPA is gonna be really instructive. Um, hopefully it's of a, you know, of a foreign official that nobody on this call really cares about. Uh, but so I think, I think we just need to see how DOJ applies it. Um, you know, that there are just too many, uh, unknowns here. And the other thing I'll just say is, you know, I think circling back to something you said at the beginning, Carlos, I think one of the reasons why this is important is because, you know, it's going to ramp up most likely FCPA investigations. Right? Like, even if you're not necessarily worried about FIPA, you could be swept into a FIPA case um, and 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 the, become the focus of an FCPA case. DOJ has another tool. Anytime they beef up in an area, right, they're going to they're going to pursue it with more vigor. So I think that that's really the the, the key takeaway here. Yeah. Um, Kelly, any thoughts? Kelly, you're on mute. Okay. Yeah, nothing new for me. I think you guys covered everything. All right, it's very, very kind. Even if, if I'm sure we didn't, I'm sure you'll tell us later. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, um, uh, Pat. No, I mean, I, I think you know, John. John said it well. I mean, you just got to pay attention. 
you know, um, we got to see, you know, how the DOJ uh, is going to use, you know, this uh, this new tool in their anti-corruption arsenal, how they're going to interpret some of the, you know, terms that we have now um, that don't have definitions attached to them uh, and just, just make it aware. You know, it's not, you know, it's um, just be, right. I mean, again, it, it's, it's something that, you know, if you're not just because you're not a foreign official doesn't mean that this this um, may not impact um, you and just, you know, pay attention to it and, uh, you know, adjust your, you know, compliance policies and procedures, you know, as uh, as warranted. Sounds good. John Barr. Yeah, I would just say uh, just uh, my my final point is really just from an anti-corruption perspective in general, which is. Um, you know, don't go it alone. If you have a tricky situation that's come up, um, get get some assistance from trusted advisors to help you think through whether this is something you should disclose, not disclose, to help you make sure that it's investigated properly and that um, and that the company is as protected as 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 possible given whatever's come up. Okay, and with that, that's it for us guys. So thank you all very very much for listening. I hope this was helpful. Reach out with more questions. Uh, remember FIFA, the CLE. And thanks again. And reach out with more uh, any questions, any follow up. Any member on the panel will be happy to chat with you guys. So, thanks again. Thanks for uh, for joining us. And again, it was our pleasure speaking with you. Thanks again. Take care, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. For the attendees, the link for the CLE form is in the chat. It'll also be emailed to you later this afternoon. Thanks all. Bye.